So I want to tell you a story about um, perhaps one of the most famous and uh, fearless acrobats of all time. Yes, Richard. <laughs> no, this was before Richard's time. This was in 1824, so we're a little bit before that. No, I mean Charles Blondin. Anybody know that name? Yes, not you. That's right, there's lots of Charleses in our family. This wasn't even this guy's real name, but his real name is French and it's hard to read. So he went by Charles Blondin. And so we're gonna, gonna go with Charles Blondin, the great Blondin as he went by. He was a gifted acrobat from the moment he took his first steps. He walked a tightrope at four years old, if you can imagine such a thing. He enrolled in gymnastics that year and he spent his life, his whole life, dazzling crowds all throughout Europe. But at 34 years young, he set out to do the impossible, something that no one had done before. No one had even thought about planning about doing because it was so stupid. <laughs> he was going to cross the 1300 foot chasm above Niagara Falls on a tightrope. Now that is so far that guide ropes cannot be attached all the way, which means as you get out towards the middle, it's swaying with the breeze and it is all wet because you are doing it over a waterfall. So it's wet, it's swaying, it's moving, it is certain death. There is 0% chance that you will survive that fall after you fall and you are definitely going to fall. So because of all of that, 25,000 people showed up to watch this thing happen because why not? What else are you going to do in the mid-1800s other than watch somebody fall to their doom, right? There's no television yet. So on uh, 5 p.m. on June 30th, 1859, he took his position on the American side. Um, he was, uh, quote, dressed in pink tights bedecked with spangles. A reporter said that the lowering sun made him appear as if clothed in light. I'm going to go back so you don't look at that one quite yet. I have the pointer, Charles. You don't need to do anything. No, Charles, don't touch it. Okay. So people held their collective breath as he walked across the thundering chasm. And after he got about a third of the way across, he surprised everyone by sitting down. And he threw down a cord down into underneath of him. And everyone on both sides was like, well, of course. He made it a third of the way. He's giving up. He's going to go down the cord. The famous Maid of the Mist, the, the ship that goes over there, lowered under him. And everyone was assuming he's going to shimmy down. But really, the captain came out with a bottle of champagne and tied it to it. And he pulled it up. And he chugged a bottle of champagne, threw it off the side, and then ran the rest of the way across. I'm telling you, this guy was something else. And after about 20 minutes, he got back on the tightrope, but this time uh, with one of those giant 1800s cameras that you have to like put over your head and all of that, got halfway, put it down, took a picture of the crowd, put it back, and then went back across. The crowd went nuts. So the next time, he, uh, and this was, became a regular thing that he did this multiple times. The next time he flipped himself upside down on the tightrope, he walked partially backwards and on the way back did the whole thing with a sack over his head, which I have. In there. Oh, it's before, okay. I put it in the wrong place. There we go with a sack over his head. This is him right here, with the sack over his head. Um, <laughs> one time he brought a table and chairs so that he could sit on the chair with his feet up on the table while he ate a piece of cake and washed it down with another bottle of champagne. Probably his most famous, yeah, that's right there. Probably his most famous one is when he went out there with an entire iron stove, lit the stove right here, cooked an omelet, 
and then lowered the omelet down to the maid of the mist underneath where they ate the omelet that he cooked up there in midair. Yeah, I like this one where his manager is on his back with a rifle. <laughs> Imagine being, he's not dabbing, no, he has a rifle in his hand. He is shooting while on a tightrope. <laughs> because he can, exactly. The man was unstoppable. And he, the people loved it. They believed that he could do literally anything. And it seemed like they were right. And one time he set out to cross the chasm uh, blindfolded while pushing a wheelbarrow. Right there. Um, and he asked the people, do you think I can do this blindfolded while pushing a wheelbarrow? And everyone is unanimously, yeah, yeah, of course you can. Of course you can. You can do anything. And he said, do you think that I can do this with a wheelbarrow with a person inside of it? And they're like, yeah, of course you can. You can do anything. You cooked an omelet out there while drinking a bottle of champagne. Of course you can. So he said, can I get a volunteer from the audience? Total and absolute silence. Tens of thousands of people and not a single volunteer, if you can imagine. Tens of thousands of people, not a single volunteer. You probably would have done it, yes. Everyone there believed that he could do it himself. They believed that he could do it with somebody else. But no one there believed that they could be that somebody else. When it came down to it, their fear for themselves was greater than their faith in him. And in some ways, that's not surprising. I get that. That would have been me, 100%. When it comes down to it, I don't have that kind of faith in myself, regardless of the faith I have in other people or in God or anything else. When it comes to it, <laughs> I will keep my feet firmly planted on the ground. Thank you very much. And likewise, in our story today, I would probably be one of those disciples standing flat-footed on the ground, craning their head upward, going, oh, shoot, what now? What, what am I supposed to do? Uh, is Jesus going to, like, you know, put on different shoes and come back real quick? Because there's still work that needs to get done. We, it, Right? Jesus has to come back and do the scary things for me. Jesus has to restore the kingdom to Israel, to destroy the Romans, to set things right with the world. Do you know how much injustice there is in the world right now? We can't do this on our own. I mean, when Jesus first came onto the scene, everyone expected that he was going to, that he was going to be this radical revolutionary who would just clean house and sweep things out and finally do things the way they were supposed to do. But that didn't quite happen the way that they expected. But then afterwards, he resurrected. He came back from the dead. He had superpowers. He could, like, disappear and reappear through walls. I mean, how can you stop someone like that? Of course, now is the time that Jesus is going to do the hard things for us. Except now he was telling everyone that he was leaving. He was heading out, and they wouldn't see him again. And that something called the Holy Spirit was going to come, whatever that was. <sighs> Maybe that was going to be the end. Maybe the Holy Spirit coming was going to be the end. Maybe that was like heavenly reinforcements. The Calvary is coming. Cavalry. Surely he didn't expect us to do all the kingdom building work. The Messiah is supposed to do the work for us. That's the point of the Messiah. If we could do it ourselves, we would have done it by now. <sighs> We cannot be expected to stand up against empires, against war machines, against entrenched systems of prejudice and injustice. I mean, we can barely focus on feeding ourselves and our family. We can barely get dressed in the morning. How are we supposed to save the world? The Messiah is our one hope of salvation. And so I would definitely be among those disciples watching Jesus disappear, silently wondering if he was abandoning us to fend for ourselves. But then the angels come and they say, hey guys, what, what do you, why do you stand here looking up? He'll be back. In the meantime, you have work to do. 
why do you stand here looking up? It's the dumbest question in the Bible. Why do you stand here looking up as your one hope for salvation floats away into the clouds? Why would you not be standing there looking up? What am I supposed to do? Our last good hope is flying away into the clouds. <sighs> I mean, tr Jesus had spent the past 40 days preparing these people, teaching these people. He even told them, you will go on to do greater things than I ever did. But I don't think any of them actually believed he meant that literally, right? They were like the onlookers watching Charles Blondin cross the Niagara Falls. They believed that Jesus could transform the world. They believed even that people could do it with Jesus. But to be a part of that mission, to be the leader of that mission, to be the mission itself, no. Maybe someone else. Maybe someone more capable. Someone stronger, more passionate, more educated. Someone with more money, more political connections. Someone smarter, more gifted. Maybe Jesus would come back in a couple hours with his the Hebrew Avengers with Moses and Joshua and Elijah and whatnot and come back and finally do this for us. The world was in worse shape than ever before and they needed heroes and gods to defend it, not fishermen and stay-at-home moms. But we know this story, don't we? Jesus didn't come back right away like they all supposed he would. He didn't even come back in their lifetimes. He didn't come back after decades and centuries of persecutions and plagues. He didn't come back after two world wars. And his conspicuous absence for the past 2,000 years reinforces the truth that he had been speaking to his disciples all along. The truth that the battle for the soul of humanity is your fight, not mine. <laughs> See, God has this annoying habit of giving people agency and not violating their consent to force them to behave. Um, God treats people like adults with respect, and I hate that because it would be so much easier if God did not and came down as a king, right, and forced everyone to behave. But God does not do that. Instead, God equips those who are willing with the power of the Holy Spirit to make the kingdom of God an earthly reality now. What a terrifying prospect that is. <laughs> to think of ourselves as the heroes that we've been waiting for. And now you may think, as many before have, many billions of people before you have thought, that's great. That's well and good for someone else. But I have so many reasons why this doesn't apply to me. I'm too old. I'm too young. I'm too weak. I'm too poor. I'm too busy. I am too small to make any kind of difference. But I'll tell you, I've read the Bible, and there are all kinds of excuses in there. And each and every time, God says, I don't care about your excuses. Moses was 80 years old when he freed his people from, from slavery. David was 15. Paul was a big city scholar with a criminal record, and John was an uneducated fisherman who'd never left his hometown. Scripture is teeming with every excuse that you have already made for yourselves and uh, already an answer to each and every one of them. So today, in this time, the world needs you as you are, in the place that you are, and the person that you are, to stand up and to spread the kingdom of God, to get in the wheelbarrow, to do the terrifying work of God, to trust that God is capable and genuinely believes in you despite the fact that you don't believe in yourself. So this week, friends, I want to pray to, that God would place opportunities in your path annoying opportunities that mess up your plans. <laughs> Too late. I already prayed it, Keela. Oh, you cannot undo a prayer. There will be opportunities for you to not look towards the bigger systems to fix all of our problems, but for you to be the solution to the problems, whether that is standing up for the oppressed in, in a 
uh, big political meeting, whether that is healing the earth in your own particular lawn that you have, whether that is showing love to somebody who doesn't deserve that love, whatever it is, there will be an opportunity for you to connect to the spirit and to step up. There are opportunities tailor-made for you all around. So ask for eyes to see them, the wisdom to identify your role, and the courage to get in the wheelbarrow.